All right, well, I guess we go ahead and begin getting started. Good day. Hope nice weekends were had. Um, main goal for this week is going to be Chapter 17, which is going to be about uh, electrical current and circuits, namely resistor circuits. Uh, last week we began looking at capacitor circuits and how they function. Now we're going to look at a different, well, circuits as a whole and a different component that can exist in circuits. And then next week will be about magnetism and then we'll start heading into test two territory. Um... Before we get started, if there are any questions about recent content or any assignments, homework, quizzes, etc., please let me know. All right. In that case, let's start looking at chapter 17. Just a second to get everything visible. So, um, the electrical topics that we've covered so far. Chapter 15 was, for the most part, charge and Coulomb's law. Uh, that being the, for the formula that determines the force between charged particles. That force is what drives electricity. Chapter 6 was more about electric fields. The fields that charged particles give off. And the fields are what exerts the force that creates electricity. And now we are going to look more directly at the actual movement of electrical, like the actual flow of electricity, what we would commonly refer to as electricity, current flowing from one point to another and how that works in circuits. So, electric current is a term that I believe is common enough part of the English vernacular. Um, we call it electric current because it does involve the flow of something, like how the current of a river involves the flowing of water downstream. Electric current is the flow of electrons. Um, they all have to move from point A to point B, and as they're all moving together in a direction, that movement, that flow, is electric current. And... The way that we calculate electric current. Uh, if you were, um, I'm going to use a lot of water analogies when talking about electricity. I've already compared voltage to water pressure. That's going to continue as a theme, as a key, at least for this chapter in specific. Um, voltage is like the water pressure that drives water to move. So voltage is the pressure that causes, that pushes electrons in mass from point A to point B. Those electrons, the, the large group of them that are going to be moving, are all going to flow. And if you were to say try to calculate or try to measure the flow rate of water in a river, that would likely be in terms of how much water is flowing per unit of time. Um, if you were studying a river and you could note like how many gallons flow past your research station every second, that would be a measure of the flow rate of the river. The more gallons that pass, the more the river is flowing, the more quickly the water is moving. Uh, electrical current is very similar. We quantify electrical current by trying to numerically state how much charge, how many electrons are flowing through something every single second. So the formula for electric current is I equals change in charge, flow in charge, divided by time. 
The I is the variable for electric current. C had already been used up by several things, unfortunately, so that leaves I as current itself. So I is the variable for current. Current is equal to the change, the flow of charge divided by time. The more charges that are flowing in a certain amount of time, the more electric current you will have. So, again, a lot like water. Just the more stuff that flows, the more current there is. And in the case of, say, electricity in your house, the more current that's flowing, the more electrons are flowing through your walls, the more electrons flow into and out of your machines, the more energy they're able to get. So current is the way that electricity moves energy from point A to point B. Again, kind of like flowing water. As water flows, you could put a water wheel into the water, and the motion of that water over the water wheel imparts energy into the water wheel. Electric current moving through things is what gives, is how electricity gives energy to stuff. It's how electricity is able to carry energy from one place to another. So, looking at the formula, the more charge passes through something per unit time, the more current you have. That means uh, more charge would mean more electrons, so more individual electrons would be flowing per unit time. The unit for current, the variable for current is I, the unit for current is amperes, also shortened very frequently to just amps. Again, it's an unfortunate situation. The variable for current is I. The unit for current is A. Uh, the letters are all over the place. But unit for current is amps. That's a term that I think comes up commonly enough in vernacular as just an electricity term. And this is the context in which it is specifically used. An amp refers to current flow. It refers to how much charge flows through something per unit time. One entire amp is one coulomb of charge passing through an object in one second. So one amp is a rate of one coulomb per second. If you'll recall from when we were talking about charge and coulomb's law, one entire coulomb is an absurd amount of charge. One electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. It would take more than a trillion surging electrons to get one coulomb of charge. I bring this up to say that one amp of electricity is huge. Kind of like how you'll never really see an entire coulomb of charge built up in nature. You'll never really see one amp of electrical current most of the time for safety reasons. Current is the dangerous part of electricity. You, you might hear in movies or you might hear in just warnings in general that, oh, this device has 10,000 volts of electricity. Volts isn't what kills you. Volts, again, is like water pressure. Volts is just the, the force, the pressure that drives electricity to move. But you can have high voltage without any electricity moving. Voltage isn't the dangerous part. Current is the dangerous part because current is the actual moving charges. Voltage is like saying, like the difference in pre potential, the difference in pressure between two locations. Uh, voltage would kind of be like, there's a million rhinos over there and there's no rhinos over there. That fact alone isn't dangerous. What's dangerous is if the rhinos are charging and you're standing in the way of them. The number of rhinos stampeding per second is like the current. The more the current is, the more rhinos, the more dangerous it is. So high current levels is what is dangerous to humans in the case of electric shock. Because the more amps you might, if you were to get electrocuted, the more amps you're exposed to, 
that's more charge flowing through your body per second. And that means that each of those individual charges leaves energy behind inside of your body every single second that they are passing through. So current is what kills you. And that's why current tends to be what's most controlled, what's most regulated when it comes to circuits. Most circuits that you would have in your home, that you would have in commercial electronics, they tend to use very small amounts of current, specifically because current is what's dangerous. Uh, as a result, again, one amp is huge. Most machines tend to use small amounts of milliamps just as safety precautions. The circuits are designed to use low current because it's safer. So, current is the flow of charge. Current is dangerous. Uh, current is calculated with change in charge over change in time, measured in amps. <clears throat> with that in mind, let's take a quick second to utilize this formula at least once, look at some conceptual information. Let's say you've built a circuit, has a battery, it turn say it has just a light bulb in it so you've built a battery circuit and it has six milliamps of current running through it over one minute how much charge will exit the battery and additionally over that minute how many electrons individually are going to exit that battery how many electrons make up this current so Using our new formula, current equals charge flow divided by time, we're told the current in this circuit, 6 milliamps. So that'll go in for our current here. The times 10 to the negative third is just to convert milliamps into amps. That's equal to charge flow divided by time. Uh, we're asked for one minute, so I plugged in 60 seconds. The formula is designed to take seconds. Uh, just all formulas in this class, if you see time, assume it wants seconds. And if we solve for delta Q, that tells us that this particular battery, over the course of one minute, will give off 0.36 coulombs worth of charge. Now that's over the span of a minute. Um, every second, the battery is giving off six times 10 to the negative third amounts of charge because again one amp is one coulomb per second so six times 10 to the negative third amps is six times 10 to the negative third coulombs per second but over the course of a whole minute we get this much charge the points the point three six now uh Electricity is specifically the motion of electrons, since they're the charges that aren't in the nucleus, they're the charges that are able to move through the circuit. As a result, uh, this charge is going to be made up of negative electrons. And since we know the magnitude of charge of an electron, we can figure out how many electrons this should be. Um, so from our constant table from previous slides, one electron has a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 16th. Uh, that means, if we kind of use this as a conversion to convert coulombs into number of electrons, that it would take 2.25 times 10 to the 15th electrons exiting the battery every second to have the same magnitude of charge as the battery gives out in current every minute. So, every minute, battery gives up this much charge in the forms of in the form of this many electrons, which is a lot. Uh, the way that most batteries work in a circuit is, uh, depending on the battery construction, they either have a reservoir of electrons of charge and energy built up inside of them, or they have various chemicals inside of them that are designed to react in such a way that they give off excess electrons as a byproduct. Um, that's the difference between usually rechargeable batteries versus chemical batteries that leak if you throw them into water. 
Either version, though, either because it has charge built up or because it creates and gives off charge as a chemical reaction, they're designed to f- direct electrons out of themselves to create the current. And over time, uh, per charge, there's just a certain amount of electrons that they're able to give off. So this is the amount of electrons this one gives off in a minute. If you were to put it into a more power-hungry circuit that needed a higher current, then you'd just drain the battery faster. More current would just mean more charge exiting the battery more quickly, more electrons coming out of the battery more quickly. The battery would just deplete its charge faster. So, a brief sample calculation involving our first new formula of the chapter. Um... Let me know of any questions, needs, concerns at this particular time. Okay. So, voltage and current work together in circuits. Again, the voltage is like the water pressure that makes the current flow. So if you were to build a circuit, you say have a battery here. The battery is the voltage supply. It's, it has a difference in potential between its two different sides. That difference in potential is going to cause electrons to begin flowing from one side of the battery through the circuit to the other side of the battery. And we, we typically, uh, at least for the sake of our diagrams, draw that as saying that current is going to start here at the positive end. This is where the potential is positive 6 volt. I don't know why I just assumed it was a 6 volt battery. Um, whatever the voltage, I might just say 6 volts, just to be consistent. Let's just say that's a 6 volt battery. 6 volt battery means that this side of the battery has a potential of about 6 volts and the other side of the battery has a potential of 0 volts. There's more potential on this side of the battery than there is on this side. And all objects always want to move from where they have high potential to where they have low potential. So this is the action that drives current to move from this side of the battery through the entire circuit all the way back to the other side of the battery. So the voltage drives current through the circuit. In this particular circuit, we've got current moving through a light bulb. And as current moves through the light bulb, when current moves through anything, uh, electrons enter the object, they move through the atoms that make up that particular object, and as the electrons move through something, they leave energy behind. Um, This energy that is left behind by electricity is what powers machines, it's what... uh, makes the gas inside of light bulbs glow and it's also what is dangerous to humans if you were to get shocked um you know how well within movies within tv you might have even noticed it in real life depending on how close you might have been to a lightning strike um whenever a tree gets hit by lightning lightning arcs out of the sky, hits the tree, and electrons within the t- electrons start entering the tree, current begins entering the tree, and that current wants to go from where it has high potential, at the source of the lightning strike, in- through the tree into the earth where it has less potential. Uh, pretty much all electricity always wants to end up in the earth, since that's the most neutral thing that we have on the planet, is the planet itself. As the electrons move through the trunk of the tree, depending on what sort of lightning struck trees you might have seen before, um, the tree usually ends up burnt. Sometimes some parts of the tree explode from rapid evaporation of water inside the tree. That all happens because lightning leaves energy behind 
the electrons, the current moving through the tree leaves energy behind in it. Um, kind of like really when any moving object hits something else, you have energy involved in that collision. The electrons are colliding with and moving through the atoms of the tree. They leave energy behind in the tree. That energy often takes the form of heat, which is why the tree tends to end up burnt. It's why the water in the tree evaporates, sometimes explosively. And that's what can create the effect. That is the that is what creates the effects of what trees look like after a lightning strike. Uh, electricity does the same thing here in the light bulb. Uh, current moves through the light bulb that leaves energy behind in the light bulb, and that energy is able to power the light bulb. That current will then exit the light bulb, flow back through the circuit, flow to the negative side of the battery. And then the cycle will begin anew. Now the way that we tend to measure these things in a circuit. We have two separate, well. Yeah, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm sorry. I'm going to skip around just a little bit. I'm going to skip around in the notes, but it's all going to make logical sense. So, the voltage of the circuit is what drives current through the entire circuit, through all the elements of the circuit. And individual pieces of the circuit, like the light bulb here, are what the current flows through, it's what the current leaves energy behind in. So that's how current and voltage work together in circuits. There is, however, one more very important ingredient to circuits, and it's the concept of electrical resistance. Now, electrical resistance is something that you, on some conceptual level, you have some idea about it already. I just might be describing it in new terms here. Electrical resistance is the property of matter that allows it to literally resist electricity flowing through, some, through that particular object. Every different object has a different inherent amount of electrical resistivity. And you're, odds are you've heard of a property like this before with regards to electrical insulators. Um, even if you've never done much with circuits or circuit diagrams before, you've probably at least colloquially heard of the fact that rubber doesn't conduct electricity, whereas things like metal and water do conduct electricity. That's because... All those different materials, rubber, metal, water, etc., all have different amounts of resistivity. Every different material resists electricity to a different extent. If something has a lot of electrical resistance, we call it an insulator because it insulates electricity. It doesn't let electricity flow through it very easily. That would be things like rubber. If something has very low resistivity, it's very easy for electricity to flow through it. And that tends to be, again, things like metals. We build like the actual conductive parts of our circuits out of metal because the metal conducts electricity very easy. It has very low resistance. And an object's resistance is additionally a measure of how much energy it tends to take from electric current. The more resistance something has, the harder it is for current to try to be forced through it. And as a result, the current tends to lose more energy if it tries to pass through that object. Uh, you could hypothetically force electric current to travel through rubber. It just wouldn't work very well. And the rubber would absorb a lot of energy from the electricity and the resulting current wouldn't be very fast. It wouldn't have a whole lot of energy left once it has to pass through that rubber. But because metal has very low resistivity, it doesn't, 
the electricity doesn't lose a whole lot of energy as it flows through metal. And that's why we tend to make most of our wires and most of our the inner parts of our circuits out of metal because uh, since there's less resistance, you lose less energy as the electricity flows through just the normal metal wires. That makes it easier for currents to get from point A to point B, for energy to get from point A to point B. Because if you spend much time doing electricity stuff, talking to electrical engineers, you'll learn that every single object, every object, has some amount of electrical resistance. That formula, the, the way that we calculate the resistance of a particular object is this formula right here. R equals electrical resistivity constant times the object's length divided by its surf cross-sectional surface area. It works very similarly to uh, the rate at which thermal energy travels through objects. Uh, if you'll remember from the heat and thermo chapters and we started looking at thermal power and thermal energy flow, different materials, uh, each with different shapes, different lengths, different cross-sectional surface areas, allowed heat to travel through them at different rates. And the rate at which electricity conducts through something is almost identical. Uh, the formula here has very similar parts to it. The length of the object matters, the cross-sectional surface area of the object matters, the what it's made out of, so this constant here, the rho, represents a constant based on what the material is made of. So what any given object's resistance is depends on these particular properties. And that ultimately means that all objects resist to some extent. Even the most finely crafted metal wires have some inherent amount of, of electrical resistance to them. And as a result, circuits tend to lose some energy just by having the electrons flow through the circuitry. Resistance pops up everywhere. Everything resists, even the wires of a circuit. And as a result, you tend to lose energy just by putting it through the wires. Um, if you talk to electrical engineers, this becomes a pretty big problem when you're trying to get electricity to flow over long distances, say via power lines. Uh, you tend to lose a lot of energy just getting electricity from a power plant to a house through power lines as a result of that. <clears throat> so, everything has a resistance to it. Uh, if it's a very small amount of resistance, that's called a conductor. If it has a very large amount of resistance, that is an insulator. Now, this matters for circuits in a few places. One, we use insulators to coat the wires so that we don't shock ourselves and so that current doesn't go places that we don't want it to. Two, it means that an object's resistance is a large contributing factor to how much energy it takes up out of electrical current. Again, if I backtrack to the circuit diagram from the previous slide, the current flowing through this circuit is what's carrying energy from the battery to everything else in the circuit. So as current enters this light bulb here, the light bulb has a certain amount of resistance in it just based on what it's made of. Um, again, what it's made of, how long the wires in it are, etc., etc. The bulb's resistance indicates uh, a measure of how much energy it's going to take from the current that's passing through it. Uh, if a machine has more resistance, it takes more energy from the current that's powering it. Less resistance means it takes less energy from the current that's powering it. So this bulb here by a function of just being an object of matter, has resistance to it. And since that bulb has resistance, the resistance of that light bulb is going to determine how easy it is for currents to be pushed through it for the current to power it. Uh, it's easier to power machines that have less resistance. It's harder to power machines that have more resistance. 
So our next formula, I equals delta V over R, is a formula that kind of ties resistance, current, and voltage together as the three primary measurements of what a circuit is doing. Voltage pushes current through a circuit. Specifically, the voltage pushes current through the parts of a circuit that have resistance. The battery pushes current through the light bulb, and that's what powers the light bulb. So this is the formula that kind of shows the relationship between these three things. These are the three concepts that kind of make a circuit. To have a circuit, you need voltage that pushes a current, and it has to push the current through something. And whatever that something is, it's just going to naturally have some resistance to it. I noticed, I noticed my signal hiccup there. I don't think I lost much time. I'll, re, I'll restate my last point, though. The three things that make up... Hmm. All right, so three things that make up a current, a, a circuit are a battery supplying voltage that then pushes current through it, specifically through objects with resistance. And this formula, I equals delta V over R, summarizes the relationship between all of those things. Uh, this formula has been, can be rewritten a few different ways, just algebraically. Uh, the way that I'm most familiar with seeing it is actually V equals IR. So depending on what science classes you've had in the past, that may be the form that you've seen. You may have seen it before in that form. Um, this formula does have a name, which I'm a little upset I didn't write down already. So I'm just going to scribble it in here real fast. This formula is referred to as Ohm's Law. Uh, the gentleman pictured here on the right is the scientist for which Ohm's was named. This is the man whose last name is Ohm, H-O-M. And uh, it's called Ohm's Law because resistance, I realize I didn't actually mention this already, resistance is measured in units of ohms. So ohms is the unit, the measurement of resistance. Uh, if something has a higher resistance, then its resistance value is just a larger value of ohms. And the symbol for ohms is the uppercase Greek omega, which might seem kind of weird, but it tracks a little bit better than using I and A for current, if for no other reason than omega at least sounds a little bit like ohms, at least in my opinion. So ohms, symbol omega, is the measurement for an object's resistance. Resistance determines how easily current is able to flow through something in particular, and the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance in a circuit is called Ohm's Law. I've been hand-waving and saying a lot of words when my signal allowed me. So any questions, needs, etc., let me know. I'm going to take a second to read through my upcoming examples to make sure they're in the order that I wanted to cover them. Okay.
Okay. Sorry about that. Just making sure that the next example is the one that I was wanting. Okay. So, uh, to make sure that we get in just a little bit of practice utilizing Ohm's Law, let's say that we have a 12 volt battery, which is a decent amount of volts. Um, most AA and AAA batteries are like less than a single volt each. Uh, and y United States wall outlets are 120 volts. So this battery is about a tenth as strong as your wall outlet, which again is pretty good. Uh, we have a 12 volt battery and we can use it to power one of two different machines. Uh, each different machine, each different object will have a different internal resistance based on you know what it's made out of, how much energy it draws in order to stay on. So we have a light bulb with a resistance of five ohms and a TV with an internal resistance of 500 ohms. So, each with its own resistance. Uh, how much current does the battery produce if in a solo circuit with either device? So we're going to look at two different situations here. Both will use Ohm's law, V equals IR, Each circuit has the same amount of voltage if we use the same battery to power either device, but each one's different resistance is going to create a different amount of current out of the battery. Um, we'll go ahead and rearrange this into the form of I equals V over R, like it was shown on the previous slide, since we're gonna be solving for current. For the light bulb, Current will be equal to our voltage of 12 volts divided by an internal light bulb resistance of 5 ohms. And that's going to give us 2.4 amps. Meanwhile, for the TV, TV's current is determined by, again, if we're going to use the same battery, 12 volt battery over instead 500 ohms, and that would be uh, 100 times less current, 0.024 amps. So, um, different circuits, even with the same battery, can result in different amounts of current flowing through them just based on what they're connected to. Just the resistance of the things that those circuits are themselves connected to. In the case of the light bulb, most light bulbs don't have a whole lot of resistance to them. They're designed for current to pass through them very quickly, very easily. They don't take a whole lot of energy to actually emit light. So since there's not a whole lot of resistance there, only five ohms, low resistance means that this voltage can push out a lot of current. Uh, 2.4 amps is a lot. I mentioned at the when we defined amps earlier that one whole amp is huge. So 2.4 amps is huge. That's, frankly, that light bulb probably has less resistance than the human body. Uh, 2.4 amps is a lot. And honestly, if you just, if you took a 12 volt battery and hooked up a single light bulb to it, the battery might explode, frankly. That's way too much current to run through a single battery. Sorry, that's way too much current to run through a single light bulb. Uh, for a sense of scale, if we hooked the same battery up to a TV, 
uh, the, and the TV has an internal resistance 100 times greater, that would create 100 times less current. So by virtue of the TV resisting more, that kind of slows down the current for the entire circuit. As a result of that, TV the, the TV ends up pulling more energy out of the circuit over time. And as a result, it'll dry the battery out faster. Uh, in fact, that might not even be enough current to power a commercial TV, given that most wall outlets are 120 volts. So this battery probably wouldn't... If the battery can run the TV in this scenario, it wouldn't last for very long. Meanwhile, the battery could hypothetically power the light bulb for a long time, assuming that the massive amount of current doesn't make the light bulb blow up first. So, resistance... Again, resistance is one of the three things that kind of makes a circuit. Um, voltage has to push current through resistance. If voltage is like water pressure and current is like the amount of water that's being moved by the voltage, resistance is kind of like rapids. It's kind of like adding a water wheel into the river. Uh, by virtue of adding those things, you're fundamentally limiting the water flow, and energy gets spent trying to push the water through those obstacles. Uh, it could also be like narrowing... A like, say you have a pipe with water flowing through it and just arbitrarily the pipe narrows at a certain point. By narrowing, it makes it harder for the water to get through. That's offering resistance. And so the water ends up using up some of its energy, ends up slowing down to be able to push through that narrower part of the pipe. So voltage is the pressure that drives the current to flow through things with resistance. We're going to constantly kind of be referring back to that trio of how they interact with each other uh, as we continue through the rest of this chapter during this week. If there's any questions or needs or concerns, let me know. I'm going to check through my notes to see if I covered everything I wanted to today. All right, so tomorrow we'll cover some more things related to electrical resistance. We'll look back at that formula about how resistance is calculated, talk about some things that can affect electrical resistance. Uh, Wednesday, we'll start looking at resistor circuits, how resistors work together in circuits, how we can kind of study the voltage current re uh, resistance relationship for more complicated circuits. And... That'll be the bulk of what chapter 17 is about. And then we'll just move on to combo examples and then homework help before next week. Oh, electrical power. That's what we'll cover at the end of the week, the concept of electrical power. Uh, with that, we've gotten through everything that I wanted to cover today. We've, I, we've hit a pretty good breaking point, I think. Tomorrow we'll do... Uh, the various factors that can contribute to electrical resistance. Any questions, needs, concerns, etc. right now, please let me know. Even questions about old homeworks. All right. If not, then we'll call our break here for the day. I'll be around if you have any questions. Uh, tomorrow will be resist, uh, again, the, the various things that can affect resistance, looking at some more examples numerically there. And if I don't see you again today, I'll see you tomorrow for that.